Hello, everyone. And uh, it's a great pleasure and honor for us uh, today to host on Onco Daily Dean Crow, who is the founder and CEO of Raleigh Foundation for Childhood Cancer Research. Hi, Dean, and thank you very much for being with us today. Um, please, could you tell us a little bit about what you are doing and how the foundation started and what you do there? Awesome. And thank you so much for having us. And thank you so much for all you do for pediatric oncology and for, you know, getting the word out and educating people. And then also for being a pediatric oncologist. Um, we just really admire y'all and appreciate all that you do for kids and families. So thank you for that. Um, at the Rally Foundation, we fund um, childhood cancer research. Our goal is to find better treatments with fewer long term side effects and ultimately a cure. Rally started when my husband was coaching um, a baseball team and one of the middle school kids, William, was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And my husband was involved in the, you know, when he was initially diagnosed and he went through 18 months of, you know, treatment, surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, and then went into remission, was doing well. Unfortunately, 18 months later, he relapsed. And when he relapsed is kind of when I got involved with some other ladies. Um, we had a little prayer circle for William. And through that, I started learning so much about childhood cancer. And I didn't know anything really before that. And one um, Sunday, my husband and I went to the hospital, William had had a horrible reaction to a blood transfusion, and actually um, almost died. And so when we went in there, um, my son, I have a son the same age as William. And the dichotomy, they were juniors in high school was just, I couldn't believe it. And so I looked at his mom and I said, this is so much worse than I thought. Um, you have to tell me what to do to help you. And I will not make you dinner. Um, and she looked at me and she said, raise money for childhood cancer research. And I said, not to be offensive, but billions of dollars in America is spent on cancer research every year. And she said, not childhood cancer. And so I asked her, you know, what was the difference between adults and kids? And she said she didn't know, um, but she promised me that there was a difference. And so I was a journalism major and I, I love investigative journalism. So I was like, I'll figure that out. And sure enough, adults get breast, lung, colon, and prostate and kids get, as you know, a different type of leukemia, ALL, they get different types of brain tumors, they get solid tumors, you know, and so it, it is very different. And the research needed, as you know, is very different. So really from there in that hospital, I said, um, okay, you want me to fund brain tumors? Because William had a brain tumor. And she said, no, I want you to fund every type of childhood cancer because every family in this hospital needs help and they need hope. And I said, okay, you want me to fund research here at this hospital for all types of childhood cancer? And she said, no, I want you to fund the best research you can find and I don't care where it is. And so really in probably less than five minutes, the mission of Rally was laid out. Um, I had no idea at that moment we were going to launch a foundation, but, um, it, you know, through evolving and, you know, discovering that there truly was a need um, is how the Rally Foundation came to be. So that was about 17 years ago. Um, why Rally? So really, you know, we were part of that prayer circle. Um, and through that, we were, you know, we made sure that the Olsons were, fed and that their bills were paid and that their grass was mowed and you know all of those normal things that need to be taken care of but we we wanted to do more like we wanted to do more than that and so what I knew and my husband knew is if we wanted to do more then then the rest of the people want to do more and they want to rally around these families and they want to help and so we need to give them a way to rally um, and a way to help so that's why uh thank you so uh, you started in 2005, right? Yes. And since that time, you have accomplished a lot. You funded, <laughs> uh, like, yeah, yeah, I mean, you granted almost 30 million US dollar research grants. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you please share some stories of success and how these grants or evolved or um, during the time? Sure. So I think, um, you know, something that's really always been important to Rally is that we are philanthropic seed investors in the next great discovery. So we always kind of had this heart to go in early for a project and then to continue to fund it and see it through. I think it's super important to how we make our grants. So our grants are made through a dual peer review process. We have um, 
the applicants, you know, the researchers apply through Proposal Central, and then each application is vetted from two different researchers. They are average scored, and then based on the score, that's what we find. So low, low score wins like golf. Um, and so then we kind of make our decisions based on those scores. So it's purely, um, you know, very, uh, very subjective and objective at the same time. So we don't fund, you know, every doctor that I've ever talked to, they're all going to cure cancer and it just hasn't quite happened yet. So that's why I have to have the medical advisory board. Um, and really we are, it is made up of top oncologists around the world. So some, you know, and I always say to our donors and our supporters, you know, funding research is not sexy. You know, there's nothing sexy about a Petri dish. There's nothing sexy about a cell line unless you're in this business and then we think they're really cool. But to the normal person, they're not. So we go in early. We, we went in really early for the research that was being funded for neuroblastoma at Memorial Sloan Kettering with Dr. Chung. We went in super early at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia for the neuro, neuroblastoma research that Dr. Maris um, funded that is now both of those are frontline treatments, you know, for children. We were in early with Dr. Grupp at CHOP for CAR T cell. Um, and, you know, and so but we were there when it, these were just kind of ideas and things that they were thinking about. We're currently funding Gregory Freeman, who is out of um, MD Anderson. He has a very exciting brain tumor um, research that he's doing. And um, so exciting. Those written up in the New England Journal of Medicine. He's about to start a phase two. So that is super exciting. But these are people that we have been funding, you know, basically from the beginning. Um, so it's really exciting to, you know, 15 years later, see um, some of the exciting things, you know, that are happening. Um, we funded Ted Johnson out of Augusta, Georgia. Um, he had Augusta University, and he has some incredible brain tumor research that's going on. Um, and I remember Ted and his development director calling me probably about 10 years ago saying, we need more funding. Where can we go? And, you know, being able to help them do that and then now see kids that are alive today thriving because of, you know, the research that we funded. So I, we love the success stories. Um, they're super fun. We also did some um, of the work out of, um, out of CHOP with the ALL. Um, we have a couple of kids that are definitely alive. Um, one just graduated from college and actually just is, um, is a, she's a registered nurse now. Yeah, and she's working on a pediatric floor. So it's super exciting to see these kids grow up and to know that we funded some of their research. Uh, very, very important and very nice progress. And uh, I, I mean, do you have some research priorities or just like in general, when you receive some good ideas and then you go ahead and uh, how do you choose like this, your research uh, priorities, if you have one or uh, several, and um, you said, I mean, do you fund only in the United States or you're more on the global scale? definitely global. Um, we have funded, you know, of course, all across the United States, and then we funded in seven other countries. So we, as um, Nancy Williams' mom said in the hospital room, um, she doesn't care where we find the cure, and I don't care where we find the cure, and our donors don't care where we find the cure, we just want to find the cure, um, or a better treatment on the way to the cure. So, um, so we have funded in seven other countries, so you should apply. Um, and so we, because um, we really, so research priorities. We if we have a donor that wants to fund a specific disease, say we have a donor that wants to fund medulloblastoma or someone who wants to fund neuroblastoma, or even they could get as granular as I want to, you know, fund medulloblastoma grade three, um, you know, we could get that granular. When we do our call out for grants, we will put that in the LOI that we have, you know, money earmarked for this type of disease. But really, we fund more. What's important to us is to fund like make sure that we're funding the fellows um, because you know they are the next great minds, making sure that we fund the young investigators and they are the next, you know, they're they going to replace the grand poopas of who we have right now. And then making sure that we fund young investigators. Um, that's really important to us. So we have a career development award that is a three-year grant, $100,000 a year with the goal for those to advance to federal funding. That is a nomination process. We allow each we invite institutions to nominate one researcher for that one, one young investigators. Um, we have done several of those and I think all but one, but that one is still currently um, being funded, have advanced to federal funding. So that's our goal with that. 
project. Well, and you then mean we which also... institutions? Sorry, which institutions? U.S. based or any institutions um, globally? Any institution. Um, for the for the um, for the young investigator, they have to be nominated, and we invite different institutions to nominate. So based on that, it, we kind of we make sure that we are getting hopefully the best and the brightest that that institution sees as the most promising. And then we also have a collaboration grant where it is three or more institutions and can be anywhere. Um, actually, we're funding some of these are international, three or more institutions working together on the same project. So we really believe in fostering collaboration. We think it's super. We think we're stronger together than we are separate. Um, so those would be our, probably more of our priorities is the fellows, the young investigator, the career development, and the collaboration. Um, and then really it's based on the application and the science and the score that they get from the medical advisory board. Uh, so uh, is it like the research priorities are different in the different parts of the world? So for example, high income Correct. countries are different priorities than the low-middle income countries. And a young investigator, even the, the very smart or very like promising in a country, I mean, it's it will be very difficult from low-middle income country investigator to compete with the, let's say, an investigator from, from Harvard, from St. Jude, from yes. uh, CHOP or, or et cetera. How do you balance it or do you balance it or it's like just merit-based? It's more merit-based, but you would be surprised um, because we like to think outside the box. And so our reviewers know that. So, and and we also do have, um, we are very, um, very, we also do fund palliative care and survivorship. So um, I think sometimes a lot of times in the lower income countries, you know, just the palliative care, the education, the survivorship, um, you know, complying to taking your medicine, how do you make sure that happens? all of that kind of falls um, in a granting mechanism that we would have. So they would probably have a, they have a good opportunity um, in that portion. And then a lot of times they will also be part of the collaborations, um, which I think is helpful. So there are also grants, like it's not like just drug discovery grants or lab-based research or like to do no. a clinical trial. Just, I mean, it has also like, uh, survivorship, I don't know, yep. psychosocial 100%. implementation research, yes. things like that. Yes. So you're yes. very diverse. Yes. I would say one of our greatest strengths is at, at, at Rally, we are nimble. And so that's one thing we don't want to lose. And so you have to really control your growth in order to remain nimble. Um, but that is something that we really value. Our board of directors values it and our staff values that we can be nimble and kind of move where the, we kind of get to move a little bit easier than larger organizations, which is uh -huh. fun <laughs> and good. <laughs> What's the largest grant you did? The largest grant a would single be grant, I mean, individual single grant. 300. Now you can, you can reapply for funding. So we have some people who we have funded for, you know, many, many years who are way over $300,000, but um, our largest single grant is 300. Yeah. And there is a cap like 18 years for, for the, for the kids or just, I mean, Oh, the... for what we would fund. Um, yeah. no, I, I don't think so. Um, I think really we would probably look at up to 25 because the way the cancer, you know, you're, I mean, I'm not going to, they, you know, the ways the, the cancers behave in certain populations, depending on the disease, depending on which cancer it is, you are going to treat that child or that 25 year old on a pediatric protocol because they're going to have more success than if you flip them to the adult protocol. So no, I would say we have a huge heart for young adult, for, you know, pediatrics, adolescents and, young, and adult. young adults. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also, you know what we see because we started, you know, 17 years ago, our kids that were in kindergarten are now young adults. And they're, you know, they're now, some of them are having babies and then some of them are having to deal with secondary cancers. Well, we're not going to leave them behind. We're going to definitely take care of them and, you know, be supportive of what they need. And then also help to fund research that would benefit them for sure. For sure. Yeah, certainly, certainly. Uh, who are your donors? Are those like, like you, you try to get, there is a thing, like we get like 100,000 uh, one dollar donor or like one big donor so what's your uh, what's <laughs> yeah. your 
So we have, a, we're, we're pretty diverse. Um, we have, um, we get money from the grassroots. So people who go out and do fundraisers for us or just hear about us and send in money. That is a good bit of the money that we get. We also um, get money from private foundations. And then we have money from corporations. We have some really good corporate, you know, donors and sponsors. And then we also have um, collaborations with other foundations. So one of the things that we started was a pediatric grants collaboration so that the donors can, so the researchers can apply just to one place instead of having to apply to Rally and a bunch of other different places, they can apply to Rally and then we will share those scores with the other smaller foundations and then we will handle the whole back end office um, as far as like doling the money, doing the post award agreement. I mean, you know, you know, cause you're a researcher. So there's a lot after you get the grant, there's a lot that happens in order to get the money. So we handle all that. So we do get, um, so we collaborate, but we handle the um, money for making sure that those are being paid out and that the money is there when someone wants to collaborate with us. So I would say those would be our four main sources, grassroots, private foundations, corporations, and collaborations. But it's not equal. It's not 25, 25, 25. Okay. Wonderful. Who is your team? Please, can you talk my, a little bit? Yeah, who is your team? My team? Oh my gosh, I have the most amazing team. So we have, um, we have a, well, one, we have an incredible board of directors who are very involved, um, which is great um, with all of governance and with the vision and, you know, where we want to go as a foundation. And then on my team, I have a senior director of development who um, is great and amazing. I call her my right arm and left leg. And then I have a director of events who does um, really, I call him the Renaissance man because he does way more than just the events. And then we have a rally kid manager and underneath her, we have three other rally kid um, coordinators and they work directly with the families and whatnot. And that is really inspiring for, you know, all of us. And then of course we have the all important accountant because we don't want to not have the accountant. So who takes care of all the money and whatnot. And then we also have um, some other people who work on the development team. And then I have someone who works very closely with me on advocacy um, and policy driven um, type things. And then within the development team, like I said, we have other people who are very important to those teams. Um, yeah. Very nice. Team is very important. I, I agree with very, you. Very, yes. Yeah. And you mentioned advocacy. You do a lot of good advocacy as well, and you had some uh, very nice successes. Can you please elaborate more about the advocacy, what you are doing, and what you achieved? Sure. So thank you for asking. Um, so when, probably about seven, eight years ago, I was invited to a really small think tank dinner in DC. And basically the aim of the dinner was to figure out where we could get more federal funding outside of the National Institutes of Health here in America. Because really and truly, like our foundation and other foundations like us, we can take the research so far, but you really need the big federal funding to advance into those clinical trials and to drive them all the way you know, to drug discovery and whatnot. So at the dinner, um, we just talked about different ways and different policies that we could affect, um, hopefully for change. And then and then also, where could we get, you know, some funding, just cash, if you will. And it turned out that the Department of Defense has a at the time they had a one point five billion dollar medical research program. And I was like, I didn't know they had that. But. I got a sign to go find, to get money from them for cancers in children, adolescents, and young adults. So we started advocating on the Hill. I wrote a white paper and made a strong case for um, that 86% of the active military fall within the AYH age range, which is 15 to 39. Um, and when you looked at the research budget of the Department of Defense, the vast majority of the cancers that they were researching were the cancers that the veterans, the older population got, breast, lung, colon, prostate. Um, but they weren't funding the cancers that the young people who were defending our country get, and they weren't really funding the cancers that their children get. So 86% of the active military fall within the AYA age range, and 50% of them are married and or have children. So um, we wrote a white paper. I wrote a white paper that basically just laid that out that showed these are the different kind of cancers and that we left the brave men and women behind defending our country and their families on the war on cancer. And so like any good soldier, we just need to go get them. 
And so there, our first year in, we got um, $3.3 million, which was really exciting for cancers in children, adolescents, and young adults. We already had a line item for pediatric brain tumors and neuroblastoma, so we just built on that. And then um, fast forward six years, we have gotten a total of $144 million funding 153 awards, which is a 758% increase. So for cancers in children, adolescents, and young adults, and then we have name topics such as sarcomas, um, thyroid, lymphoma, uh, germ cell. And so the researchers, when they apply to the Department of Defense, can pick specific topic areas like sarcoma or neuroblastoma, but they also then can pick cancers in pediatric adolescents and young adults, which helps you know spread more of the money around. But you have to advocate every year on the Hill for the inclusion of that report language, super important, and fill out a boatload of forms. <laughs> I don't know why they can't have just one form, but they don't. <laughs> you built a very successful foundation. And um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it was difficult and I'm sure there <laughs> were a lot of challenges. How did you handle it? And what would be your um, your advice for the nonprofits, for the foundations all over the globe? Mm. Because you, you know, I mean, uh, Pediatric cancer and pediatric cancer research relies largely on the on the funding uh, from the yes. outside. Yes, um, I would say number one, you definitely want to have your finances in order, um, and you want to. Um, I think that's just the most important thing is that you are taking care of the dollar donor and that you are very aware of what you're doing with that dollar. I always look at every dollar as that could be the dollar that cures cancer or finds the better treatment. So the money that we're spending, we're very careful about that so that we have a high efficiency rating, which I think also gives you then a lot of credibility with your donors. So Rally operates and has for a long, long time at 93 cents. So for every dollar we get in, 93 cents goes to support our mission. We twice received a perfect score from Charity Navigator, which made us the highest ranked char childhood cancer charity in the world that was funding research and giving family services. Um, so I think that's super important. Um, you have to really understand what their algorithms are, but, you know, making sure you're taking care of the dollar donor so that then you are rated, you know, to give you that credibility. I think in the beginning, you have to be willing to be, you know, the chief bottle washer, and you also have to be willing to be the chief executive officer. I know you know that role very well. Um, so you have to be willing to do a little bit of everything. As you grow, I think you have to be willing to let go. Um, so that can be also a whole nother challenge because you're used to doing it all. And then all of a sudden you're like, wait, I can't do everything. And so what is it that I can really let go? Um, and that is a whole learning curve of letting go and letting other people help you. I think you, it is super important that you have a well-defined mission and that you don't have mission creep. I think mission creep is super easy to do. Um, one thing that we do at Rally, um, if someone came to me and said, I want to fund Dr. Smith at Children's Hospital ABC, I'm like, you don't need me. Like, if you want to fund Dr. Smith at Ch Children's Hospital ABC, go give Dr. Smith that money. Now, if you want me to vet Dr. Smith's research, happy to do that. And you do need me to do that. Um, but he's going to have to apply and go through the process. But then you're going to know that your dollars that you're investing in Dr. Smith are really well spent and that he's doing really viable, good research that should continue. So I think having a process for if you're gonna fund research, how you're going to do that. And it just needs to be really drilled down and you can't waver from that. And one, I wouldn't waver from it because I don't understand science enough to waver from it. And like I said, in the beginning, every doctor that I talk to is gonna cure cancer and I'm just waiting for that day. But you know, I make, I have them apply. So I think that's really important to have processes um, in place. And then I think it's super important um, to thank your donors. You know, without your donors, you have nothing. I mean, you can't, you can have all the passion in the world, but if you don't have the dollars and the donors, you don't have anything. And the only way to, you know, do that is to let the donors know how much you appreciate them. Um, and then we keep our inspiration before us all the time. We keep rally kids or anyone can be a rally kid who fought cancer um, from birth to 99. Um, you can you can sign your kid up to be a rally kid, whether they are living or that they passed away. You know, their story matters and they matter. And, you know, every day we talk about our rally kids and 
they inspire us every single day to, you know, rally on. And we know every family would give up, you know, every bell and whistle, if you will, from getting to be a cancer kid. Um, especially in America, you know, there's a lot of family support for fun trips and, you know, room makeovers and whatnot. We love all that. But we know every family would give that up if we could cure their child. And then they could just go on and have a normal childhood. And so that's our inspiration is for that to happen. Thanks a lot. And what are your future plans? Where the Rally Foundation and Dean Crow are leading? So I think, you know, remain true to our mission. Super important. We want to, you know, for sure do that. Um, we want to continue to be nimble. Um, I think that that gives us a really good advantage in helping, being able to help the researchers, y'all, and help the families the most by being able to be nimble and also help our supporters. Um, we want to continue to collaborate with other organizations, and we want to continue to build collaborations within the pediatric oncology research, you know, field. We want to see more collaborations built, so that's part of our vision. And then we really um, are working hard. I think it's super important and would be great if we could have a pediatric oncology drug company by a pharma company strictly dedicated to making childhood cancer drugs. Um, Rally is really involved with an organization called Onco Heroes. Um, and so, so we are really hopeful um, and working also with, um, with Washington to help make that happen. I think we have tried to, and it's not a bad thing, incentivize big pharma to care about kids with cancer. Um, they don't, you know, because, and, and I understand why I don't like it, but I understand it. And if I sat on their board of directors, you know, for big pharma and, uh, you know, someone came in from R and D and they said, we have this incredible breast cancer drug and it does this, this, and this, and we feel like it has so much promise, but we also have this incredible rhabdomyosarcoma drug that da, 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 and I'd be like, I don't even know what rhabdomyosarcoma is. I mean, you're going to end up your, you know, your audience and your patient population for breast cancer is so much bigger. I understand that. I might not like it, but I understand it. I think we've tried to incentivize them to, you know, big pharma to do the rhabdomyosarcoma, the neuroblastoma, the, you know, medulloblastoma drugs, all, all the pediatric drugs across the board. Um, why don't we incentivize those companies that are trying to make it as pediatric biopharma companies. So in a way, I think we've gotten it backwards. Um, so we we're having some good discussions um, in Washington about how can we incentivize so we can have a pediatric um, biopharma company. And there's room for more than one, for sure. Um, so like how, so that's something that we see working on in the future, for sure, continuing to advocate, you know, on the Hill for the Department of Defense funding. Um, and the other thing that we're working on is, and I think COVID really proved um, to us that we can do this. I think we can expedite clinical trials. And I think we can make families enrolling on clinical trials easier for the families and easier for the child. Like, do you really need to travel you know, 12 hours to get a blood draw and a scan at the hospital that is sponsoring the trial. You probably don't. And do I really need to see you in person once a month? Or could I see you as the doctor on Zoom maybe twice? And then in the third month, I come and see you. So I think there's low hanging fruit for expediting tr clinical trials here in the U.S. Um, so we're also working, um, you know, on that. So kind of some really big ideas. And then in addition to, you know, doing our fundraising and putting on our events and, you know, working with our rally families. But that's kind of what the future holds for us, I would say. Just a little bit. <laughs> uh, much important and uh, really um, a place where where a lot of efforts are needed. And, mm -hmm. um, and I'm really happy that you are working on that direction because pediatric cancer research uh, and especially drug development Mm -hmm. needs a lot of hands and it really uh, does yes yeah and yes. Uh, unfortunately i mean the, the progress in uh the progress also the progress in pediatric cancer in pediatric um uh drug cancer drug development started also from the uh pediatric cancers in general mm -hmm. in oncology but yes. during the time and it's understandable but still we we still need to do a lot to to push it forward that uh pediatric cancer research get uh, gets prioritized. 
Right. And I think, again, I really do think um, I was actually fortunate enough to be invited to the White House in September, which is Childhood Cancer Awareness Month here in the United States. And um, I was part of an um, innovative you know, discussion group, breakout session. And that was in that discussion is, you know, uh, Ricardo Garcia from Onco Heroes was talking and I was watching all of the doctors just shake their heads in agreement with everything he was saying and, you know, what the company was trying to do. And that's when it hit me. I was like, why aren't we helping these companies who ha already have that mission and that heart? And they, that's what they want to do. They want to bring pediatric cancer drugs to the market. Let's incentivize them. And we don't need to go incentivize the big pharma because big pharma is, you know, th again, th that's not their, it's not their mission. And I think, you know, so much of life is driven by your mission, whether it's a personal mission, a personal mantra, or it's your company mission or your foundation mission, you know, we're all driven by our mission. So I think we need to align from a drug perspective with people who have the same mission that we do. Um, so it'll be, yeah, I, I stay tuned on that. I, I think something big is going to happen with that. I really do. Um, it just makes sense. You know, some, it was kind of like with the Department of Defense. All of a sudden I was like, wait, we're fund you're funding over a hundred million dollars for cancers that your active military aren't getting. So once you kind of logically can lay out the argument um, and make it simple, people really start to listen. So I think that there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of hard work, but a lot of opportunity. And, you know, as you know, the pediatric cancer community, when they get fired up, you know, they make things happen. And um, we have the more than four battle cry. You know, it used to be that the NIH gave less than 4% for childhood cancer research, which was horrible. And then we came up with the more than four battle cry and now they give close to 8%. You know, so your voice matters, their voice matters and we make a difference when we can all have a unified voice together. So yeah, drug development, huge, we need it. So, I mean, it's frustrating as a funder of research to see research progress and they do a clinical trial and it shows success and then the drug company doesn't want to make the drug anymore. It's like, oh my gosh, all that w wasted money, wasted time, but worse, the kids, they suffer. The families, they suffer. And we have to change that. And that's the story that needs to be told. And there are companies like Onco Heroes that want to change that story um, and that are 100% committed to being just a pediatric cancer drug biopharma company. Um, and so I think that's really important and not to be bought out, um, which is something that happens. And understandably, again, I get it. <laughs> I get it. I don't like it, but I get it. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, as a woman leader, I mean, what's your what's your strengths and weaknesses and how you, you go further? I, I, I mean, uh, as a woman leader, how 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 you are accomplishing everything this, what you are doing? I think as a leader, regardless of if you're a woman or or a man, um, you have to know your strengths and your weaknesses, and you have to know what you are good at and what you're not, and you have to be willing to hire to what you're not good at, and let those people do their job. So I would say when Rally first started, the very first thing I did was I went and hired an accountant because I am not, I, I do, one, I think it's very important that I have an arm's distance from the money, but also that's not my strength. You know, taking care of the money, not my strength. Um, we have a joke at Rally when they see a donor um, hand me a check. So one of my staff comes behind me and takes the check because they're like, that could end up at the bottom of her briefcase and we may never see it. <laughs> so in addition to that not being my strength. So knowing what those strengths are and knowing what you're, you know, what you are good at and what you're not, and then hire to or surround yourself with people who have those strengths that you don't. Um, I would say if you're putting together a board of directors, super important that everybody that, or this is super important to rally, everybody on our board has a reason for being on the board and it is not because they can strike a big check. So that, that we need people who can really help. So you know, we make sure that we do have um, that CPA, that we do have an attorney, that we do have, you know, people who are have a background in fundraising. We have the medical background. So we make sure that we have what is needed um, on our board. And I think 
you can't be good at all things. And so, you know, I know that there are certain things in there that I have people on my board that are really good at it. And I'm so grateful for that and, you know, call on them. We have a board of advisors. Um, the great thing is if you're on the rally board of advisors, you, we never have a meeting and you only have one responsibility. And that is to pick up the phone when I call you, because if I call you, I need you to answer my question and I need help. So I think that that for any leader who, you know, just to know and to be able to spot people who would really, you know, strengthen you and strengthen your mission, strengthen your organization is really important. Um, so I would think that that is probably would be my best advice is surround yourself with people who fill in for your gaps. And there are plenty of gaps. <laughs> Wonderful advice. Yes. Thank you so much for very interesting uh, and inspirational and motivational uh, talk. Uh, it was really great. And uh, congratulations with all what you do. Uh, this is very important. And without so important. supporters, without foundations, without people who are, uh, I mean, on the ground who are supporting us, mm -hmm. pediatric oncologists and pediatric cancer professionals would not be able to do uh, and to have the progress. No, so and thank, thank you very you much again. for everything. Thank you for what you do for, you know, all your research and like I said, taking care of patients. Um, we talked about at Rally How in America, you know, every day, 47 families find out that their child has cancer. And that's about two classrooms full of children. So I always picture like a classroom of children laughing and playing. And I picture the classroom next door of kids laughing and playing, you know, and that's about 47 kids. And Today in America, 47 families are going to hear the devastating news that their child has cancer. And all 47 families have the exact same question for you, pediatric oncologists. What are you going to do to make my baby better? And Rally exists so that you can have great answers for those families. So thank you for what you do. Thank you, Dean. It was uh, amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Have a great day, too. Take care. Bye-bye. Right.